Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to part two of World Space Week. So globally, World Space Week ended over the weekend, but here at ANU, we had so many great events planned that we wanted just to keep it going. This series of events is sponsored by the Australian National University and the ANU Institute for Space, which we like to call In Space. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands and airways we meet and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. My name is Professor Anna Moore. I'm the director of the ANU Institute for Space and the ANU Advanced Instrumentation and Technology Centre. Thank you for joining us um, for this discussion about how space data and satellite images can help manage bushfires. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Marta Yebra, a distinguished remote sensing expert and researcher who has many titles. She is director of the ANU Bushfire Initiative. She is an ANU in space mission specialist. She's senior lecturer in environmental engineering at the Fenner School of Environment and Society. And she is a senior lecturer at the Research School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Environmental Engineering. And she's also associate editor for Remote Sensing of Environment. Dr. Yebra has received many awards, including the prestigious Max Day Environmental Science Fellowship from the Australian Academy of Science, the CSIRO Pine Scott Career Award, and the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC's Outstanding Achievement in Research Utilization Award. But you may know her from her most important work, helping to fight bushfires more effectively with satellite data during last year's unprecedented fire season. Marta is a recognized expert and is often called in to advise on the ground firefighting teams about satellite data that can give them a more holistic view of the fires that they're battling. So Marta, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, Anna. <laughs> uh, to the audience, we'll be taking your questions th throughout the event. Uh, please don't be shy and uh, please, uh, we welcome all of your questions. You can sign them up in the Q&A section of this webinar and just start them at any time. So Marta, the work you're doing is, um, is amazing, it's valuable, it's fascinating to countless Australians. We'll spend most of our time talking about it, but for the students who are watching online and thinking about their own education, let's start at the beginning. So uh, what got you interested in studying, researching and teaching remote sensing? And um, do you want the long or the short story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish I could say that I've been interested in remote sensing since I was a child, but that was not my case. Uh, it may sound a bit strange, but I think I got interested in, in remote sensing because of fate. <laughs> and let me elaborate a bit more on that. So when I was very little, I was only interested in, in dancing ballet. I was in a professional company until I was 18 years old. And then I had an injury at a very good timing because it was time to start thinking about studying at the university. So, and then I wanted to study dentistry, so very different to, <laughs> to uh, what I'm doing at the moment. But uh, yeah, um, I took the mandatory exam to access the university in the, for dentistry, uh, but unfortunately I didn't get the mark I needed, only for point two, so very little difference. And then I, I decided to take a year off. Uh, first of all, uh, to repeat the exam, but then during that time, I really had quiet time to think about what I really wanted. My life was so busy, training so many hours, uh, ballet dancing, that I didn't really have time to think what I wanted to do professionally uh, when that career was closed. So, um, uh, so I dedicated time to get information about uh, what I could study and I got into environmental science. I got very interested on in studying environmental science and decided to, to do that. During that, um, 
those studies, I had a course on remote sensing. Uh, and I have to admit that although I found it very fascinating, uh, I didn't fully understand the utility of remote sensing when, while teaching the course at the university. Um, even though we had some computing labs with practical uh, samples, I, I still didn't get engaged. So it was only towards the end of my degree when I volunteered uh, to do some field work for a project uh, that was, uh, uh, which aim was to map a uh, bushfire risk in a national park. So I, I went with some scientists to the field. I collected the data. I really put my hands on the research and I say, wow, now I understand why this is useful and I, I, I wanted to do this. So I, I is when I decided to, to do a PhD on that topic. That's wonderful. Um, you know, uh, talking to many women researchers in particular, it's fascinating that when you ask them that question, they've often done a, uh, a journey to get to where they are and as amazing scientists. And it's almost like that breadth of experience and the journey in it uh, has really helped them, you know, when, when they get there. I, I certainly did that too. So it's really great to hear. Um, so, uh, so moving on to space, space data. So you and I often think and talk about space and, um, and all the data that we can get from observing uh, from space. Um, but most people, uh, I don't think, appreciate that, that as, as much. So it's always a surprise to many people that you can get data for, uh, for Earth observing for bushfires from space. So why should that matter to um, Australians? Yeah, well, that's a good point. So, uh, so this uh, matters for Australia because it, it actually benefits uh, every single Australian in many different aspects of their lives. So space uh, technology are critical in impacting uh, government, industrial and personal daily decision making. So this especially comes when, for example, for communications, earth observation, and even uh, fostering the economy growth. So some examples, for example, is that uh, just over a few, well, more than a few years, a decade ago, perhaps, we were not using weather apps or online mapping applications to, to get uh, more efficiently to our locations. And now we cannot live without those. And also more specifically to the topic of my research and um, with remote sensing data, uh, we can give very accurate information uh, for fire managers uh, to plan before, uh, during, and after a, a fire. And, um... So uh, with regards to, to bushfires in particular, um, you know, the, the access to space now is, is much easier than, than it once was. And this, this lends itself to lots of, of new opportunities, lots of innovation. Could you say a little bit about that with regards specifically to bushfires? Yes, so, uh, yeah. well, um, as you said, uh, um, now we have opportunities for more immunization. Up to now, we have mainly been using satellite data uh, that has been collected by other international space agencies uh, um, because, well, Australia doesn't own their own space mission uh, and we have a space agency that is uh, fairly new. It, it has, it was funded like a couple of years ago. So, um, so, so far we've been yeah, using the data we get and we haven't complained and we've been making developments with the data we get. But now uh, we have the opportunity because uh, access to space is easier uh, to de develop uh, missions that are more target uh, to specific applications in good farm management. And, and we can work with engineers to, to design and launch those missions. Great, exciting. Um, so, um, so as we're here tonight, uh, we, um, we're seeing major wildfires burning through parts of California. Uh, just last week, these fires were compared to the um, unprecedented bushfires we had here in Australia last year. We both live in Canberra um, and uh, like many, many others struggled to make it through that summer season, both driven by drought and extreme heat. 
We lost almost 6 million hectares of eucalyptus forest in the 2019-2020 bushfire season. And California's already lost more than half of that vegetation. And historically, October is the most dangerous time of year for fires there. What do you think about when you read and see these headlines? Well, oh, I feel very anxious. Um, I think um, I want to help, but at the same time, I feel a bit powerless because it's, it's truly incredible what is happening these years, the scale and the impacts of uh, these huge events that we are having in, over the last years. And we certainly need to understand what's going on uh, with these uh, century fires because uh, they are certainly changing and so does uh, need uh, to change the way we manage uh, and monitor fires. And in fact, you were part of a team um, that just examined the effects of last year's um, unprecedented bushfire season on Australia um, and compared satellite data um, to on the ground estimates of damage. Um, what did you find doing that? Yeah, well, we carried uh, two different uh, studies that uh, conclude two different uh, things. So one um, of the studies uh, uh, I did with colleagues of the University of Tasmania and Golongon and the University of Alcala, that is the Spanish university where I did my PhD. Uh, this, this study um, uh, was um, carried out to determine, determine uh, whether the black summer bushfires were anomalous. And we used uh, satellite data from the European Space Agency to analyze the burn areas for all the satellite records we have since uh, 2000. And uh, we also analyzed uh, the data and written uh, records of all the major fires in Australia from since uh, 1851. And with this, we wanted to gain a broader geographical and historical perspective of, of the fires we have had since, since that time. So what we found was that the, the extraordinary scale and intensity of the Black Summer fires uh, were driven by climate uh, conditions that has not been seen in, in, in a century, including three years of drought. And most importantly, what we also saw is that uh, there were a lot of inconsistencies uh, with the way government records uh, um, are uh, about the fire stairs extent are done currently uh, using uh, field and, and aircraft-based uh, uh, technologies. And those records were inconsistent with uh, the numbers uh, we got from the satellite uh, records. So the official numbers of, of the burn extent uh, of the last fire season uh, coming from the official government records uh, were 24% uh, larger than those we obtained uh, from the satellites. Mm -hmm. and, and this was mainly uh, due to the fact that um, uh, the satellite uh, can pick up uh, patches in the landscape within a fire perimeter that hasn't been burned but uh, the government reports about the fire perimeters and assume that all the vegetation in that fire perimeter is being equally burned. And then the, the other uh, little uh, study we did uh, was um, uh, looking at the severity of the fire in the Oral Valley uh, in the ACT. So that's mm -hmm. the fire we had uh, at Namaji National Park near Canberra. And um, this uh, work was done uh, with ACID Parks and Conservation Service. So we flew with an helicopter uh, over uh, the park to collect uh, observations of uh, the fire severity around the park. And the objective was uh, double. One, uh, to use this uh, data to validate estimates from the satellite. And the other was um, also to assess um, the severity of the fire. So what we found basically was uh, that 45% um, of the burn areas uh, of the park uh, were impacted at high severity, at the highest severity levels. And that uh, could explain that the regeneration in those areas uh, will be slower. So the vegetation will take longer to recover in those areas. Yeah, and we also show uh, that in uh, some areas, um, 
that uh, had been burned uh, with prescribed a burn nine months uh, before that fire were almost untouched, whereas or, uh, all the um, areas that were burned uh, in the four or five years previous uh, the, the, the wildfire last year were burned but at a, at a lower severity. So it, the study suggested that the program of the ACT park, the prescribed burning program of the ACT parks um, kind of was effective to decrease the severity of the overall valley fire. Right, understood. Wonderful. Um, so uh, we're getting some great questions in. Um, everyone, please keep those uh, questions coming in because we'll be reaching our Q&A part of the night pretty soon. Uh, so Marta, when did you first get involved in firefighting efforts? Well, firefighting efforts, I, I don't fight fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I guess you mean uh, supporting uh, uh, with information for firefighting. Well, um, during my PhD uh, that I finished in 2008, um, I was working uh, with two multidisciplinary projects that were assessing uh, fire risk um, in Spain. And during that time, um, we had some end users from the fire industry involved in the project to make sure that our research was focused on their needs. Um, but at that time, um, there was no a truly engagement. Um, it was more like an advisory role uh, from the fire agencies. But um, I, I found very frustrated that um, when, when the project finished, and this happened very often in research, um, the research was not used. So kind of the project dismissed di di and, and uh, all the tools and the, the online tools we developed just stopped because there was no continuation for the funding. But when I, when I came to Australia um, uh, and then uh, I joined the Bush Farm at Hazard CRC and I led um, the development of the Australian flammability monitoring system, the story changed completely. So the Bush Farm at Hazard CRC is a research center that is funded by the fire industry and the force since the beginning of any of the projects um, uh, the end users are engaged uh, very much and to make sure that what we work on and the research we produce will be used by then. So the engagement since the very, very early stages of the project and saving that project uh, on a way uh, to make sure that they will use the products uh, that will that make uh, the difference. So it's been mainly in the last years when I have seen that my research is being truly used uh, to make decisions and uh, had impact beyond publishing the research in a journal. Right. Well, that, I mean, that's a great message to take forward, isn't it? Not just for bushfire researchers, but for all of us, right? That are, um, to, to really make sure you engage with that end user and know their needs and because um, then your own research will be it's translated. very important. And used. Yeah, wonderful. You cannot expect that uh, and you said we'll read your research paper and we'll make use of it. That's not going to happen. That's wise words for all of us. Um, so more recently, um, you and I have been talking about satellites, and uh, which is very exciting. So can you can you tell us uh, a bit about your efforts to build a satellite that can detect areas where fires are more likely to occur? Yes. Yes. So so um, as I previously. Um, I said uh, most of my research so far is in making use of existing satellite data. And when uh, using that data, I realized that there were a lot of limitations because that data, um, those uh, satellite missions, uh, the data from those satellite missions I was using was not uh, specifically uh, designed to map uh, fuel uh, properties. That is mainly what, what I, I, I do. So I, I use satellite data to retrieve information about how dry uh, the vegetation is. And that is important because the drier the vegetation, the more likely a fire is to occur if there is an ignition source. Of course, we still need that ignition. And um, 
Uh, so I realized that the, the data was doing a fair job, so, uh, but it was not uh, very specific. So that's why um, uh, we are working uh, on this specific uh, mission um, to, uh, to be the first Australian mission target to monitor the fuel condition. And uh, we are going to tune the sensors to be more sensitive uh, to monitor uh, moisture content and fuel load in eucalypt forests that have a very uh, um, interesting way to reflect the energy from this, the sun. So it's, it has a, a very different spectral properties that other um, vegetation types uh, in Australia and across the world. So, so what you're saying is that what you want to be able to do is to map Australia to quite fine detail to understand where those potential hotspots could be the season before. So you're not talking about detecting fires here during the season. You're talking about knowing where those hotspots and dangerous areas will be the season before and then being able to give that information to end users uh, when I say end users, that's a very formal, isn't it? So we <laughs> yes. get that information to, to areas where they can maybe even protect their towns and things like this and, and where um, fire services can focus on, on, on that um, when the season comes. Is that, is that about right? Yes, sadly. So um, having very accurate and timely maps of fuel most to content and, and fuel loads can inform all those decisions you, you made. So they can use it to... Uh, to um, issue uh, public alerts um, for a potential higher fire risk. Um, they can make decisions about closure of fires or issue total fire bans. So it's, um, all these decisions are based on information of fire weather, of course, but also the condition of the fuel. And also um, it's very important for planning prescribed burns, for example, because those prescribed burns that are more and more difficult to plan because the fire season are getting longer and longer. So the windows of opportunities to, to do prescribed burns are reducing uh, quite a lot. So um, um, this information can help them to schedule those uh, burns. Uh, so they will do it in, in a time, at a time uh, where the fuel is not too dry uh, because if it is too dry, there is high chance that the fire will go very quickly out of control. And also during the response, um, this information is uh, normally input into fire behavior models. So um, once uh, a fire has started, um, information about fuel condition coming from the satellite can be used to run fire behaviors and know what's the most uh, likely uh, likely a path that the fire may follow. Um, so I know that you uh, got the idea for this particular satellite by um, chatting to an astronomer who had, a, who had a, um, an interesting piece of technology, someone, an astronomer who knows absolutely nothing about bushfires. So could you say a little bit about that? Because it's a really nice story about why, how you can end up with some really great solutions when you put different disciplines together. It was a very interesting experience because at the beginning, uh, we could not understand each other very well. <laughs> I knew a lot about fires and I, I knew about satellites, of course, but more like an user. I, I, I've never build or I've never even thought about building my own satellite so and he was the opposite he he's a person uh, Rob Sarp uh, very experienced on building infrared technology for astronomy missions so he was always pointing up to the sky and so it was very interesting first of all to make him think to point down <laughs> and look at the earth instead of the stars and uh, and I, I have found it very, uh, I have found it a very interesting experience to talk to him, um, and yes, trying to to get uh, the the mission concept details. I know what it is needed on the ground um, to make my modeling. He knows how to build the technology to 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 make that possible. So it's a very nice uh, team. 
Uh, just a reminder for those that have uh, just joined us recently, please keep sending your questions in. We've got some great questions, uh, which we'll get to very shortly. Um, so Marta, um, if your satellite, your bushfire satellite is successful, it'll be one of the first Australian uh, satellites um, in space. Not, not the first, but it'll be one of the first and probably one of the biggest. Um, because Australia is, is just entering the space industry and uh, again, and uh, has great ambitions. So how does that, um, how does it make you feel that you're part of that, you're part of that community? It makes me feel excited. <laughs> yes, but also, if I'm honest, I've been nervous uh, because it's a very ambitious uh, goal. But um, yeah, I feel very proud to be able to contribute to to those first um, family of satellites that will be owned and, and will be built by Australians. So, and then, yeah, with two main advantages, I guess one is that, again, they will be fit for purpose for Australian conditions. So that will be a game changer uh, in terms of the acquisition of data and that I will use for my modeling. But then, of course, it will contribute to the Australian economy and thus, especially in these uh, times of uh, coronavirus crisis, is something very important. Um, well, just to follow up on the, um, the working with partners and, and driving the space industry. So um, how important is it to work with global partners in this area and bushfires? I know, for example, both uh, from the agency perspective, both NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, you're working uh, very closely with them to do this. Could you say just a little bit about that? Well, it is very important. Um, it is, yeah, it's really important, uh, mainly for probably um, in two different angles. One is because um, global coordination of wildfire earth observation initiatives uh, will enable the development of virtual constellations of satellites uh, that will collect information pre-fire, during the fire, and post-fire um, to monitor um, the, uh, the landscape. Um, and, uh, and also it will help to, to standardize uh, processing and products uh, delivery. And such coordination is very important to ensure the maximum value of, of the products we will generate to the emergency management uh, from air observation systems. And, uh, and with that, of course, uh, will facilitate the, 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 the ability of, of the emergency management to adapt to the rising threat of wildfires and, the, and their climate change. But then um, in terms of, uh, again, data provis provision, so it, um, it's also very important uh, to have collaboration with other countries. Uh, for example, there is um, one thing that is called the International Charter for Space and Major Disasters uh, for Wildfire Emergencies. The charter is, uh, is very efficient uh, to prioritize uh, data acquisition. So basically when a country um, has an emergency, a natural disaster or something, they can activate the charter uh, so all satellites point to that specific location and they provide as much Earth observation data as, as possible to, to help and inform um, the decisions around that specific natural disaster. So again, international collaboration is important. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to go to a question because we've got um, two questions from, from someone who wants to really dive into the details with you. So this is probably a good time. Okay, so Michael says, data, it would be good to have details. Infrared, question mark, biomass, question mark. And then another one is, I really need to understand the physics that is used before any of the discuss discussion can be understood. I hear data, but I've got no idea what it is nor how to interpret. Yes, that's a wonderful question. I didn't know that as well <laughs> before I started to do this. All right, so um, in simple ways, uh, so the solar radiation uh, hits uh, the surface of the leaves and then uh, the leaves uh, of the vegetation in this, I'm talking about vegetation because that's our target at the moment. That's what we are monitoring. 
um, depending of the, of the water content uh, that uh, those leaves uh, have, the energy is reflected uh, in, in, in a lesser or in a greater way. So when the vegetation is very dry, most of the energy in the solar wave infrared region is reflected back to the sensor, uh, to the sensor in the spacecraft platform. But when the, uh, the plant has a lot of water, most of the energy is absorbed. So because of those differences in the amount of energy from the uh, sun that uh, is reflected back because of those differences, uh, we can do some modeling to retrieve fuel moisture content. And for fuel biomass is similar, but instead of focusing on the absorption of the water, uh, we focus on the absorption by other uh, components in the leaves by, uh, for example, cellulose and lignin. Right, and so if we were to take a picture of this vegetation from space using optical wavelengths, like what our eyes respond to, you wouldn't be able to do any of this. You would, right, no. just the colors of the, of the vegetation. So, so by being in the, uh, what we call the one to two or two and a half micron region, the short wave infrared, our eyes don't see, we don't see this, but the camera does. It's able to distinguish uh, both how dry patches of vegetation are and also um, uh, what some of the, um, the, con the, the content, is that correct? Am I getting this right? The type yeah. of plant and things, am I getting that one right? Yeah, that's correct. So there are some uh, plant uh, functional types uh, that um, respond more to the visible range of the spectra. Uh, and we know about that, the, the grass, for example, uh, is green when it's wet and then it gets yellow when, when it's dry. So for those type of fuels, you can um, retrieve kind of indirectly uh, the water content because of, of the change in the color. And it's because there is an indirect relationship between the chlorophyll content in the leaf and, and the water. So as the plant uh, get drier, the, the pigments, uh, the chlorophyll pigments in the leaf uh, uh, decrease and the leaf uh, change color. But that doesn't happen in, in eucalypt forests, for example, uh, or other plants that are very well adapted to drought conditions. Oh, okay. So that's why we need to go to the soil infrared region. Right. Well, Michael, I, that was all for you. And I hope let us know if we can answer something else there for Mar Marta can answer something else there for you. Um, so um, your latest project is director of the ANU Bushfire Initiative, um, where satellite data is just part of, of a much bigger initiative, a much bigger picture of what you want to do. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that initiative where you're not just using the satellite data, but it's a much more holistic uh, technology, um, social aspects of bushfire resilience and science as well? Yes, so far uh, we've been talking about the uh, monitoring fire risk, mainly the pre-fire um, phase of uh, bushfire management, but uh, for the new uh, bushfire initiative we are targeting a better early fire detection and extinguishing. So our overall uh, ambitious uh, goal is to detect a fire one minute after ignition and extinguishing it 60 minutes after we detected it. And why do we want this? Because um, it sounds obvious, but the longer it takes a fire to be detected, the larger it's going to be, and therefore the harder it's going to be uh, to put it off or to control it. So that's why uh, uh, we, we detected, uh, sorry, we, um, we agreed that uh, that would be our ambitious uh, goal. How do we achieve that? That's a, 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 another uh, story. So and 60 minutes or 60 seconds? Oh, 60 seconds. Did I say yeah, minutes? I oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting light in the day. <laughs> 60 minutes. Second, yes. Um, no. So it's, it's one minute. So what yeah. you want to be able to do for the whole of Australia, or at least for those hot spots you've already identified the mm -hmm. season before, is that you want to be able to detect a small fire within one minute. Yeah. Then that's right. And then alert 
your whole the whole system around it to be able to put that out wow that's that's a huge vision so uh yeah let's break that one down a little bit yes so um, to get there um we need a combination of technologies there is no a single technology that will achieve that ambitious goal uh, and of course satellite imagery is not going to achieve uh, that goal but itself as well so what um, the program um, um, uh, we, the program we put together uh, consists in a larger uh, approach uh, to boost fire detection so we are going to be testing in the short term um, on ground sensors and cameras uh, mounted in fire towers uh, that will be monitoring at a very high resolution and, and frequency uh, specific areas of high risk in the landscape that we will identify uh, with fire agencies. The initial trial will be in the ACT, uh, in the ACT, in Namaji. Um, but of course, um, this uh, will be complemented uh, with uh, platforms that can uh, look at larger uh, scales like high altitude balloons, drones, and of course in the higher uh, layer we'll have uh, satellites. And the objective in terms of the satellite, because we are talking about space, uh, is to have a, a payload uh, specifically designed to detect active fires uh, um, with optics in the thermal infrared um, mounted in, in a geostationary satellite that will be able to constantly look at Australia, providing imagery, very uh, high resolution, well, not high resolution, medium resolution, around 100 meters probably of and Australia. Like, I'm sorry, Mara. When, when you say resolution. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean the spatial resolution. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the size of the pixel on the image. Uh, so the minimum unit in the image uh, that you can see. So, for example, if we talk about 500 by 500 uh, spatial resolution, that means that you can you cannot distinguish anything, any component uh, within that spatial resolution. Uh, and the higher the spatial resolution, the more smaller objects uh, you can see uh, from space. So, with the geostationary satellite, um, um, we can have uh, a lot of uh, temporal spatial resolutions, sorry, temporal resolution. So we have a lot of frequency in the imagery because again, it's geostationary satellite. It's always looking at the same location on the earth and can take imagery, let's say, for example, every 10 minutes. Um, so just going to the questions, um, Sean asked, is the data collected from geostationary satellites? Well done, Sean. So I think we've just had that one answered. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have a question from Jeffrey. Is, is it technically feasible to precisely map fire edges from space in real time? Hmm. Um, it depends <laughs> how you define precisely. Sorry, I cannot say that word precisely. <laughs> um, and again, it depends on the spatial resolution of the um, satellite data you are using. So currently, uh, from space, um, you have a private owned satellites that can collect information uh, at centimeters spatial resolution. And that has been used to, to map the perimeters of the fires as well. Uh, and there are quite a, a few private companies that provide that data. But uh, using publicly available uh, satellite data, uh, uh, the best you can do is uh, using the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 data that is about 10 or 20 meters spatial resolution. So again, that's uh, the accuracy uh, you can get in terms of the perimeters. But yeah, it's, um, satellite data uh, has a huge potential in terms of uh, mapping uh, the progression of the fires. Fantastic. Well, the questions are flowing in. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna jump straight into questions now, Mara. Some of these are, these are fantastic. Um, so uh, Daniel, will the data from this new satellite have a public API for we hobbyists playing at home? <laughs> awesome. well, I don't think we have 
Cloud that jet. <laughs> well, you do. You may have an answer, Anna. What's your view as the director of in space? <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess so, I, but I, I don't think we have worked carefully in the business case, uh, but um, most of the data, uh, we, most of the algorithms we have developed um, to provide information about fuel, most of content are all based on public platforms that can be accessed by anybody. Uh, and one of the samples we've got is the Australian Flammability Monitoring System that was developed by the, uh, with funds from the Bush Fund at Hazard CRC. Uh, but yeah, I don't think we have decided around that, but uh, um, yeah, if there are no constraints uh, around that, I, I will happily make the data publicly accessible. Well, I think that raises a great question. I mean, I'm an astronomer by trade and we often um, uh, rely on a public identification of interesting targets. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, you, we have machine learning tools and things like this to try and spot certain things, but um, it's still today, at least, artificial intelligence is not quite at the level by which it's as good as a uh, human re recognition of something unusual, like a, a strange galaxy or a star that's exploded or something like that. Um, and I think, so could you say a little bit about the, um, the computational requirements needed to spot these, uh, these fires? And um, because I think that's, that's a very strong component of what you're doing. It is definitely as, uh, and as we move to higher spatial and temporal resolution, the computing uh, needs uh, are even higher. Uh, so yeah, we, we have a team of experts on artificial intelligence that are trying to get uh, clever algorithms to compress the data. So instead of uh, having to, to run the, first to, to download and store it all the historical ar archive of satellite imagery in a local repository, um, we have uh, the data on the, crowd, on the cloud so the algorithms can be run on demand. But again, for being able to do that, uh, we need to have a very uh, clever artificial intelligent algorithm that will be able to compress the information so it can be uh, run at, at real time on the cloud. Um, so just, just trying to get some more questions in here. So we have a question from a good friend of ours, Christopher Tyler from um, the Fireball Network. Um, Who's, uh, do, they're doing some fantastic stuff in Australia and California, if anyone wants to reach out and, find, and read up about them. Okay, Chris asks, by when do you want your one minute system up and running? <laughs> yeah, well, um, by when definitely finished and proved by uh, 2025. That is the, the, because the program we've got is a, a five years program. But of course, we, we are going to start the trials in this summer. Um, so uh, Jeffrey, is it technically feasible to precisely spot new lightning ignitions from space in real time? What would it cost to establish a specialized satellite to do this job? Yes, it is possible, um, but uh, I wouldn't know how it would cost to have a specialized satellite to look at that, um, but um, I, I assume you will need also a geostationary satellite if you want to, um, to have real-time information on, on the lighting emissions uh, with high frequency. And if that's the case, a geostationary satellite payload uh, can cost on around 100 millions um, to develop just the payload, then on top of that is, is the satellite itself. And they, those needs to be very large satellites. Mm -hmm. It's not like the CubeSat that are cheaper to build and quickly. Yeah. But then, if, I mean, compared to the devastation, uh, you know, financially and emotionally, more importantly, of a, a fire season like we just had, 100 million is you know, it's not, it's not really, you know, compared to the economic hit, um, that's uh, certainly something should be considered. Exactly, and, and the benefits can be uh, 
great because uh, yeah, with the ground stations of uh, lighting detection, there is still uh, the problem of um, spatial interpolation. So you have X station, uh, ground station in X locations, and then you always have to interpolate the data and the prediction. Okay, question from Lily. Hi, Lily. Um, 60 seconds, which means we need a satellite constellation. And I assume the number of satellites are not a small number. Is that correct? I think you sort of uh, answered this with geostationary, but maybe it's a, um, maybe you could say something a, a little bit about geostationary versus the constellation approach. Yes, uh, sure. Yes, uh, so yeah, for polar orbit, orbit satellites, because of course they have a time to revisit uh, the same location of, of the Earth, uh, you need a constellation, as you said, uh, if you want to achieve a high temporal uh, resolution and for active fire detection, that's a key aspect. You need to have uh, frequent acquisitions uh, to make sure you, you just don't miss uh, the ignition time. Uh, if, if you only over five at 11 a.m. in the morning and the fire starts at 1 p.m., it's going to take you far too late, <laughs> too, too long to, to detect that fire. So, um, sorry, I lost, what was the question? So we, yes. Um, so well, my question's been, been taken off. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question was, um, if you have to, if you could only use, uh, con, you know, if you could only use low Earth orbit to do the fire detection, yes. then you need a lot of satellites because you've got to have that 60 second refresh, basically yes. refresh rate. Yeah. But, but, what, but what you've explained is that um, by using a geostation, we, I mean, maybe we should explain what that is. So a geostate, mm -hmm. maybe you could, uh, sorry, I'm asking your question. The geostationary <laughs> satellite um, uh, can, take, uh, can take more imageries uh, uh, per day. Uh, with just one single satellite, you can take uh, imagery every 10 minutes. To achieve that with a LEO constellation, you may need around 200 uh, CubeSats. Uh, or even more. Christopher Taylor may have the answer to that. Uh, but um, but uh, the geostationary satellite, um, because it's further away in the space, um, will need, um, it cannot achieve uh, the spatial resolution that uh, you can achieve with low Earth orbit satellites. Um, and therefore, um, the, the probability of a geostationary satellite to to detect a small fire is lower than a low Earth orbit satellite. So that's why we need to combine uh, both. The geostationary satellite gives you the temporal resolution. So it gives you the frequency. It makes sure you don't miss the fire, even though it is a bit larger when you detect it. But the low Earth orbit uh, constellation gives you a lot more uh, ground resolution that is uh, essential to detect small fires. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so uh, a geostationary orbit is um, a, a sweet spot where you put a satellite because its velocity is the same velocity as the Earth rotating. So what that means is it's, it's always above you uh, at any time of the day. It follows you as it does its orbit. And, and that's a really great um, orbit for things like communications and for taking pictures of the same place above the ground. But it's a lot, it's a lot further away. Okay, so... Um, uh, Sean, so will that higher resolution, less than one meter, uh, be available from geostationary or will it need to be in closer orbits? I can... I uh, can... <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> um, I think you can achieve a one meter spatial resolution from low Earth orbit. Indeed, there are a lot of private companies that uh, provide that, but we don't aim for that. Uh, we aim for a spatial resolution from LEO of about 10 meters um, square, yeah, on the ground. And then, but from GEO, because you're just so much further away, yeah. you know, a factor of 100, 100 away, it scales like that, so you need, a telescope which is a hundred times bigger, <laughs> to be able to see this, this like if someone was holding a banner with I am here you'd be mm -hmm. able to see that in lower orbit, but you wouldn't be able to see that detail at geostationary thankfully fires are very um, a, a hot they produce a lot of photons 
so you can you can detect them from a long way away. Um, Tony, have you considered the policy and funding implications to best leverage this technology? Current funding policy for, for fires places the funding burden on local councils first until a localized state of emergency is declared. Great question. Mm. Uh, to be honest, uh, we haven't considered that. Um, we initially wanted to demonstrate the technology and the capability of the technology uh, before going to get to the implementation and, and the, at, at a government level. Um, yeah. Oh, my screen just refreshed. Okay, so this is from Anonymous. Will you be able to predict weather created by fires with this new satellite? Mm, that's an excellent question. Um, all right. Um, so, weather created by fire. So, there, there is uh, some research that has been done to, to look at the, the clouds and the shape of the clouds and see if that can give you some information on, on, uh, on when pyrocumulus are, are um, developing. Uh, uh, so that's uh, like the, the preface uh, before a firestorm. And, uh, but I don't think so wave infrared uh, will be the best uh, technology to look into that um, because uh, so wave infrared has a bit of um, penetration into crowds. Uh, so perhaps uh, for that kind of application, uh, visible bands uh, uh, that may be able to track uh, clouds uh, is more efficient. But it, it could be something that potentially uh, could be useful for. Um, and we have another question from Anonymous. Um, so can space data and indigenous fire control practices be used together? Hmm. Um, I guess, uh, why not? <laughs> but I guess indigenous uh, practice, uh, they know very well um, their land. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess the, the main um, uh, issue there is that they, they know when to burn, they know how to burn. So. I'm not sure how uh, satellite data could inform their practice uh, uh, because again, uh, in terms of prescribed burning, I can see how fire managers use this information to, to plan and know when and where to burn, but indigenous uh, have their own knowledge of the land. So I'm not sure up to uh, what extent they will even want to consider <laughs> this information. But it's definitely a very interesting point and perhaps something that we should definitely have into account and, and discuss with these communities to see how they think this information could inform uh, their knowledge as well. Um, what's, what we're certainly seeing, um, uh, thank goodness, a lot, a, a lot of that, those conversations happening both in the US as well as, as, well as here. So mm -hmm. there's obviously a... I mean, just tremendous amount of experience there that's maybe not being used as um, much as it should be. So it'd be great to see that. Um, Isaac, um, what is the biggest challenge, Marta, you have faced in your work? Oof, <laughs> the biggest challenge I have faced in my work. Um, yes, I guess um, uh, be brave enough to put a product uh, in front of end users that perhaps I, I, I know is not perfect, uh, but it could be useful. Uh, let me elaborate a bit more. So scientists tend to, to only uh, disseminate information when they know it's perfect and is very much ready to be used and they have proof that it performs with a R square one and, and no errors at all. But, um, but if you wait until that moment, um, you may lose opportunities and, or you may never make a contribution uh, to a specific application. 
So with the time, I have learned that um, farm managers uh, appreciate uh, the implementation of research that is perhaps not perfect, but uh, can still improve uh, their decisions somehow. But it's also very important to, to make sure they understand the limitations of, of the research um, or, or the product itself. So know what are the uncertainties of, of the product uh, you are producing. For example, if you are producing a map of fuel moisture content and has an error of X percent, they, they need to know what's the error, what's the uncertainty, so they can base the, their decision in, in based on those uncertainties. So if the uncertainty is very high, um, they may not trust that specific estimate at a given time. If the uncertainty is low, they may uh, use it um, to inform the decisions more strongly. So that's been a challenge because again, at, at, at the beginning I was a bit perfectionist as well. But uh, yeah, I have learned with the time that you can still provide useful information even though it's not perfect. Um, and um, uh, I think we have time for one more, one or two more questions before quick. Have you considered using the more detailed fuel moisture maps to enable fire prediction softwares to more accurately predict fires operationally? Definitely, definitely. That's one of the key uh, applications. But um, at the moment, um, most of the Five behavior models that are used operationally uh, far, by far agencies are not ready to directly ingest uh, these detailed spatial maps of fuel most content conditions. So some of the um, uh, line of research uh, that I'm trying to foster uh, is um, to, to further develop uh, developing five behavior models that are better uh, placed to, to directly ingest this detailed information and uh, can be run especially um, and, and be updated uh, regularly. And a uh, very last question from me. So let's, let's go into the future five years with what you are starting now with your collaborators um, in industry and in the fire services and, and others. Where would you like, what would you have liked to achieve in those, in five years looking back? In five years time, yeah, again, I would like to have this um, integrated information system where the fire managers can have accurate information about the landscape uh, condition, dryness, loads, at different spatial and temporal uh, resolutions using any kind of data that has been collected at any time. Um, and that can be directly ingested into a fire behavior model as we have uh, um, um, discuss now, now uh, to, to know where the fire is going to progress. Uh, but before that, of course, uh, we, I, I, I would like to have this integrated uh, approach for early fire detection. So again, first, we detect a fire very quickly, then we know how the fuel is. We integrated this with weather uh, conditions and we run the fire behaviors. We know exactly where the fire may go and, uh, and and all based on uh, satellite information that is provided automatically to, to the end users in a very um, end user friendly interface. That is another <laughs> uh, thing that is also difficult to, to develop sometimes. Wonderful. Well, we've, co we've come to an end. I could be speaking much longer as always. Um, thank you so much, Marta, for joining us and for um, giving us a, a vision of, of where Australia could be leading the world uh, in five years' time with, res with, with, with regards to bushfire management. Thank you, Anna, uh, to you and everybody for listening. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful questions, and we'll see you next time.